sometimes we have a lot of vocal music around here, a lot of words. A lot of words sometimes get in the way of just being present to the music. And it's kind of nice to just have some beautiful music take us to a place of stillness, of peace, of reflection, and awareness. They're called Gypsy at Heart. And I have uh, many friends that consider themselves to be gypsies. And one thing I know about a gypsy heart is, especially this group as well, because they go where the music goes. A lot of what you're doing is improvised in the moment. Is that correct? A gypsy goes where the music calls. We have been on a hero's journey here at Unity North. It's a long journey, and it began January 1, where we began to listen to the inner music, to listen to the stirring and the urging from within us that says there's more of you to give. There's more of you to be. There's a hero's journey and adventure in front of you, and I'm calling it out. The music is calling it out. And we as gypsies must follow where the music goes, even though it scares us down to the core. Even though it makes our knees knock down to the core, we must follow where the music goes. Because then we will not only have a gypsy heart, we will have a hero's heart. And if you think that your fear, with what you've been, been given as your call, and that your fear is unique to just you, think again. Joseph Campbell clearly indicates and says that this is a necessary step on the hero's evolving. We must come up against, once the call is there, the human self that says, I can't do this. Not me. I don't think I'm enough to do this. That reluctance is part of every single hero's journey. Certainly our master teacher Jesus did that. Take this cup away from me. Take this cup. I can't do this. And then he dropped down into a higher presence, a deeper presence, the gypsy heart, if you will, the hero's heart, and said, not my will, but thy will. Not my limitation, not my fear, not my doubt, but something greater, more powerful, is calling out from within me. We must answer that call. And to answer that call here in the month of February, it's all going to be about beyond. Campbell talks about walking through the threshold. Our next step is to go from where we have been to where we are going. And that means cutting the rope from the, uncom the, the comfortable to get to the uncomfortable. From the known to the unknown. You see, the unknown is where all mystics live. Mystics live in the place of the unknown, but they have to absolutely sever that which is grounded to a human limitation in order to experience the vast miracle of heaven on earth that is the fulfillment of facing the dragons within and externally to become the hero. I want to use as a context for, the, for today this brief story about a mountain climber. A mountain climber was eager to conquer the mountain before him, and he went up all alone. As he was climbing, it got later and later and darker and darker. And night fell with a heaviness as he was still at a very, very high altitude. Visibility was zero. As he continued his ascent, the climber suddenly slipped and fell. Plummeting rapidly, he could see only blotches of darkness that passed before his eyes. He fell for what seemed like an eternity into the emptiness. And he thought, certainly... This is it. I'm going to die. But then there was a jolt, a jolt that almost tore him in half. Yes, he thought to himself, like any good climber, I had attached a rope to me, and I had attached it to the mountain. Whew. As he was hanging there in those moments of dark silence, it was completely pitch black. As he remained suspended in the abyss, blinded to anything except his own thoughts, he cried out, Help me, God! Help me! All of a sudden, a very deep, still, and gentle voice spoke from within him. What do you want me to do? Save me, he cried. Do you really think that I can save you? The voice replied. Well, of course you can. You're God, aren't you? Then cut the rope that is holding you. There was a long period of silence, and the man held even more tightly onto that rope, and he finally said, can I get a second opinion? <laughs> and the voice again said, trust me, cut the rope. The man held on vigorously, ignoring the instructions. And the next day, when the rescue team arrived, they found a mountain climber 
frozen, clutching onto a rope, desperately hanging onto a rope, hanging just two feet off the ground. See, we're about two feet away from the next chapter of who we are meant to be. We are about two feet away from shining more magnificently than we have ever shown before. And we're hearing that inner music that's calling us forth to the next chapter. And we're out looking for a second opinion. Let me get validation from outside of me and ignore the validation that's already happened on the inside, the inner light, the inner presence, the inner goodness. For the month of February, we're about cutting the rope. We're about cutting the rope to any limitation, any thought, any habit, any notion, any feeling, any relationship that has kept you from answering the call and walking through the threshold into the mystery. We're about severing ties with any energy of any kind that has kept us grounded in a place of fear and doubt and kept us from moving through that portal into the next chapter. We're going to uh, use as context for this one of the greatest heroes of the Bible and one of the most reluctant heroes and leaders of all time, Moses. Three things Moses had to deal with. Moses absolutely had to deal with three things, changes of paradigms, internal processes that had to be confronted in order to get to the next step. Let's put the cartoon up there. I've got three cartoons to demonstrate what Moses had to deal with. Cartoon number one, you can see, I believe it's uh, on that one right there. After 39 and a half years of wandering in the desert, Mrs. Moses secretly asked for directions. <laughs> on our hero's journey, if we are expecting to do business on the, one, the other side of the threshold, the way we have done business on this side, we are going to fail. We have to let go of all the mechanisms, all the learning, all the ideas and notions that have kept us from asking for help Leave it aside. So many people think, well, I'm the hero. I've got everything I need. I need to be the heroic who is strong enough, smart enough, good enough, and all these things in order to achieve it all by myself. That is an old paradigm. That is an old illusion. It is not weak to ask for help. Man, I, we, we get to listen to this a little bit more. It is not weak to ask for directions. The guidance that you need, the God that you need, might be speaking as the person to your left or your right here today. It might be speaking as the person that you love at home that didn't come to church today. Might be speaking as the person that just drives you up the wall and that you want to rip your hair out when you're in their presence. The voice of God is speaking and we need to look with different eyes, a different heart, and different ears in order to receive that guidance. We need to leave behind who we have been, that thus who we can become has a space to move into. And that is scary. That is scary. I stopped at many a gas station in the, the not-so-good part of town, scared to death. But you know what? If I don't, if I don't ask the, for the help, if I don't seek the help and change my old ways and old patterns before I get there, I will be in the bar, bad part of town known as my human consciousness, my human limitation and my ego. That's a bad part of town, and oh, it's dangerous. But I must seek and I must ask. The next cartoon, the one on that side there. Take two tablets and call me in the morning. So many times we think, well, a hero is a hero because they have no fear. But there is no fear. And they think, I need to be so courageous that the fear just melts away. I hate to tell you that you've come here today looking for that magic pill. I don't have it. Fear is a part of your human experience. Fear is a necessary part of the evolution of your consciousness. When you're stretching, when you're growing, when you're becoming, fear is going to be your partner. And there isn't a magic pill, a magic prayer, there isn't a magic scripture, there isn't a magic teaching, no matter what anybody tells you, that will take that fear away from you. You need to be the great spiritual master, like a, a karate master, to take the energy and to use it in a different way, to transform it and to make sure that the fear, even if it's there, is at 49%, not 51%. We need to be conscious enough as the hero to manage the energy of the fear and not try to perpetually put it away from us, shove it away from us, and resist it. When we resist it, we say this in unity, that which you resist, what? Persists. The more you're pushing the fear away from you, the more fear you're going to have. The more you embrace that fear as part of something to teach you, to grow from, the more you will be the master of the fear and not the other way around. 
And then the perpetual, or the, the uh, uh, beautiful picture of Moses parting the Red Sea. Now, we don't teach that that actually happened. But what we do teach is that the Red Sea is within us. It is within our mind. It is within the field of our being and our spirit. And we must come to the place on our spiritual path of recognizing that which is of God and that which is of the ego. We must begin to separate the wheat from the chaff, truth from illusion. Our human eyes want to see illusion, want to spend time in the illusion. The hero, the mystic, the gypsy will all spend time in the greater awareness of what God can do. God by whatever name you want to give it. Here we give it the name love. What is of love? What is of fear? And when we do that, we clearly part the Red Sea and a path is laid out before us. You see, the hero's journey must start within. It must be an internal process first and foremost, or the path will not be made visible. There will be no path laid out before you until you can clearly discern this thought that you're having. Is it of love or is it of fear? Let me separate it, and suddenly that which was so scary, a big giant ocean of impossibility, becomes a beautiful path of possibility. And then you can take the step. Scripture says with God all things are possible. With love all things are possible. And that which you cannot do from the level of your personality, you can do from the level of the love that you are. So Moses had to deal with all three of these things, and so do we as spiritual seekers, as heroes. Now, how many people have excuses? When the call comes and the music starts playing, you've got the excuses of why it isn't going to work. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough education. I'm not in shape. I'm not good enough. Somebody else can do it. They're better than I am. All the excuses come up, and Moses had them. So you're not new. Your excuses are not new. Let's visit Moses' excuses, and let's see what the voice of God from within him had to speak. Excuse number one. Let's put it up there. I invite you to read it with me. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Anybody ever ask that? Who am I? Who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. You know, if, as I examine the hero's journeys throughout time, it is always out of the ordinary that the extraordinary is born. You might feel very ordinary, but the view of God, the view of the infinite that sees you, that knows you, that created you and manifests your life, knows you as a perfect expression of light and love and goodness and wholeness and perfection, and that you are good enough. It knows nothing except your goodness. That presence that brought you into manifestation knows nothing but your magnificence. And anything that is unlike it is a thought that is anchoring you down to a limited reality. And it's time to cut the rope. Who am I? Who are you not to be the shining example of the presence of God on earth? Who are you not to do that? And this is what God responds. Let's say this together. Let's put that up there. I will be with you. This comes down to a faith issue, plain and simple. Is your faith in your limited resources or is your faith in a power and presence that's working through you and as you? The focus must shift, turning the other cheek, look a different direction. Your limitations will not ever define you. But the very essence of light and love that you are will define you. And if you're on your hero's journey and you think that your intellect is the tool that is going to get you to the end, think again. Because the intellect is merely a tool underneath it. Underneath it is a source of that intellect. Underneath it is a source of the wisdom, of the thoughts, the mental capacities. You are not your thoughts. You are not your intellect. You are the presence of God. And if we dig to a deeper place, we begin to see that God is the source of the intellect. Now, there's a lot of creative people in this community. A lot of talented, created people. And if you think your talent and your ability to create is going to be what accomplishes the hero's journey, think again. You are not what you do. You are not your ability to sing, to play music, to, to dance, to paint, whatever it is. You are not your ability to problem solve. You are not your ability to wiggle out of challenges and problems and limitations. Underneath that is a source. We need to peel the onion layer back on a regular basis. I'm not any of these things. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not my skills. I'm not my talents. I'm not my relationships. And the veritable presence of God. And we must dig to a deeper place because with God, what? All things are possible. With, with man alone, with your thinking alone and your creativity alone, you're not going to make it. You're not going to cut the rope. 
And then you'll be found the next day hanging, going, why didn't I? Why didn't I? You know this. You're cutting the rope, and she's about ready to fly. But it's scary as hell. Cut the rope and know that you will be held. God will be with you. A power and a presence so profound. That's who you are. The inseparable, indivisible, inextricable oneness of all creation. I want you to take that on. I'm throwing that mantle upon your shoulders. You are the inextricable, indivisible, inseparable oneness of all creation. Hold it, breathe it, express it. Excuse number two then comes to the surface. Let's read this together. Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? There is no shortage of people that when you step out on your hero's journey that are going to be the very rope. The relationships will be the rope that said, oh, you're going on a journey of God. Tell me about this God. Use words to describe that which is indescribable. Use, use adjectives to describe this thing that is beyond, beyond adjectives. Use feelings to tell me about this God that has called you to the next version of who you're supposed to be. When that God is beyond description. Use metaphor to describe that which is impossibly acce accessible to us in metaphor. No shortage of people that are going to hold on to that rope. And they're going to say, come back through the threshold. You're risking too much. You're risking too much and they're going to pull on that rope. That is the very moment we have to cut that rope. Because you're being dragged down by an anchor of consciousness that will never allow you to become what God has intended you to become. What the universe has caused you and called you to be. This is what God had to say. You all know this. You've heard this. This is the name of God. Let's say it with one powerful voice. I am who I am. And when those people and those critics want to tell you you're wrong. And they want to tell you you're stupid. You've been listening to those crazy unity people that are telling you to risk and you're going to lose everything. I am who I am. I'm not defined by the crazy people at unity. I'm not defined by your negativity. I am defied, defined by being who I am. You see, God is an experience. It is beyond mental constructs. It is beyond religions. The experience of this God by a hundred names, light, love, life, I don't care what you call it. It is an experience that cannot and will not be encapsulated in a human construct or a human box. And so if you find yourself eternally frustrated that you have the inability to express and to say what this experience is, if that frustration is dominating you, you never touch the face of God. If you can just simply let the critique come and it goes off your back like water on a duck's back, I am who I am. I will be known by my fruits. The master teacher said we will be known by our fruits. He didn't say by your words, by your fancy prayers. No, he said by your simply your being. And when you cut that rope, you're not only creating a possibility for yourself to go through a threshold, you're a wonderful demonstration for all the people that were holding you back that, well, I want what he's having. Maybe I can do that too. Here's the next excuse. Moses has an answer for everything. What if, t together, what if they do not believe me or listen to me? Do you know who he's talking about? They. We all have they in our life, don't we? The people that are holding onto the rope, and they're tugging, and they're not going to believe you. If you're on a growing path, there's going to be a whole multitude of people who don't believe you, who will call you nuts. Is that the voice you're listening to? Or you're listening to the voice of God that says, cut the rope. And eventually, I'm not telling you to, to uh, make any rash decisions. But if those people are perpetually in your life as the anchor, cut the rope. Because there's a greater relationship and experience waiting for you on the other side. But we have to be the advocate of the change. We have to be the change that we want to see. See... And it's good for them. But you're not helping them. By perpetually being frustrated, trying to explain to them, here are the words that will help you know God. Here are the ideas that will help you know God. Here are the metaphors that will help you know God. If you're in that perpetual cycle, you become the conduit. You become the savior for them when you cut the rope. We're not going to play that game anymore. Go take my words and go try to have the experience. Go experience God for yourself. There's no magic pill. There's no magic prayer. 
I can say a thousand words up here and they are meaningless unless you go home and try to implement the principles that we teach here. Yes? I often say, you hear me, it's like a dead horse here. Take what we've done in here and go out those doors and live differently. If it stays in this room, you're wasting my time and you're wasting your time. Take the energy, because it's all energy. God is just an energy. Take the energy and go try something different. Take a step left or right or forward or back and know that you're just a little bit closer to the threshold of who you are meant to be. And God is calling you. The music is playing. Answer the gypsy heart. Yes? Excuse number, oh, this is what God says. What if they do not listen to me? Together, I will show them through you. Now, that's my Reader's Digest version. There's a whole bunch of things that God talks about there, about throwing stabs on the ground and they becoming snakes and frogs taking over the world and, and disease and all kinds of things happening. I don't want to go into the details of that because basically God's saying, I will show them through you. A great partnership. You are in partnership with the divine. And that's not a job of Buddha or Moses or Jesus or any prophet. It is your job to be in partnership with the divine. And that which you cannot do, that which you don't know how to do, God will show you. And they will pay attention because you will be known by your fruits. Trust. 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 Cut the rope. Excuse number four. And this one's very near and dear to my heart, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Let's read it together. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Many people don't know this about me, but I stand here today. What I'm talking about today is not just a pretty theory, something I learned in seminary. I stand here today as somebody all through elementary school, all through middle school, and into my early high school career that was a horrible stutterer. Maybe not quite the level of the king's speech, but it was really difficult for me to communicate. And my stuttering to try and mask it, I became a wonderful mumbler. I was, it could have been a character on a cartoon. <laughs> Nobody could understand anything I was saying. I was a mumbler, I was a stutterer, and I was a very, very soft-spoken person. I came by it naturally. There were some physical things that could be easily fixed. But boy, the work that went from elementary school to high school was the emotional work that had to be done. I was born into an environment where I was told for a very long time you were to be seen and not heard. What you have to say has no value. Many of you are sitting here today nodding your head because you're in a similar environment as an adult. What you have to say is of no value. We don't want to hear it. And that will show up as stuttering. You know how it showed up for me into my adulthood? Because I was able to transcend the, 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 that kind of talking. You'll notice that comes out, by the way, occasionally. The hero's journey is not a one-time severing of the rope. It's a sever. It's a sever. And it's like, uh-oh, I'm back down the mountain. i got to sever that rope again. Last week, I, out of my mouth came the words, and Jesus went to wash their feet. <laughs> Grammatically, it was totally wrong. It's not because I'm stupid. It's because I was struggling with my humanness in that moment and was having difficulty bringing the words out of my mouth because I dropped down into my humanness. And if you go back and watch the game tape of that day, there was a moment where I said, stop, breathe, return home. I was able to speak again. You know, and what, what happens, and the staff will tell you that I still struggle with this. Because what I learned at a young age was to leave out important information. Communicate and give this much information when they really needed this. They're perpetually asking for more from me, which sometimes is frustrating. I know it's frustrating to them, but I learned don't, don't talk too long because their time is way more valuable than I am. Their time is way more valuable than what I have to say. I want to tell you I'm in a perpetual state of learning that lesson. And I get better every day. I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm better than I used to be. And I want to bring you on that journey through the threshold that what you say is important to the world. There isn't just one prophet. I've been having dialogues with a lot of my religious friends who are saying, well, there are certain prophets. Certain prophets are the ones that have been chosen. I'm saying hogwash to that. Here at Unity North, you have been chosen. You have been chosen as the hero. You have been chosen as the mouthpiece of God. And anything within you that is limiting your voice from being heard and speaking up in the midst of 
racism, speaking up in the midst of hate, speaking up in the midst, uh, midst of diminishing any human being on the planet, don't shy away from that. Cut the rope of your limitations and speak loudly, proudly, and in love. And you know what? You will stammer, and you will stumble, and you will stutter because it's new territory, and you don't know how to feel it and how to do it. This whole job here at Unity North is new territory for me. I am an introvert through and through, and to stand here before you is like a demonstration. I'm not asking for praise. It's a demonstration of acknowledging that I'm glad I went through that threshold. I'm glad I went through that threshold and that one and that one. And so I'm tasting it, and I want to pull the rope because I want to pull through. I want you to pull through with me because I behold you. The one gift that God gave me to stand here and do this job is I can behold the light of who you are. No matter how you behave, I know you to be the magnificent expression of God because somebody did it for me. Don't let me down. Don't let the presence of God down. And you may be falling, and it may be dark and black, and you may not. I'm scared to death. And you get to the bottom of that rope, there is a voice speaking. There's more of you to give. There's more of you to be. Cut the rope. Cut the rope. When I know my God self, I can speak easily. When I drop down into my humanness, I will start stuttering. And I will have problem. I'll start to speak really, really fast. And you won't understand what I said. Drop down into your humanness. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's the only way I do my job today. I seek first the kingdom, and all things are added to me, the ability to speak and to share and to grow and to stretch. I want you on that journey with me because I love you that much. The last excuse, the last excuse, uh, number five. This one is my favorite because you've all spoken it at some point. Let's say it with a powerful voice. Oh, Lord, oh Lord please, please send someone else. Been there? Got the T-shirt? Somebody else can do this because there's somebody better than me. There's somebody stronger than me. Send somebody else. My wife was noticing the horrible state of the foster care system in Santa Cruz, California, where we used to live. And she looked around and said, there's such a need here. And her constant prayer and verbalization was, God, why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God send somebody? And then when she got quiet, because we must get quiet to hear the voice, God said to her, I did send somebody. I sent you. Moses, I sent you. Susie, I sent you. But who am I? Oh, Lord, please send somebody else. No, no, no. I sent you. And this is how God responds to Moses. Let's put it up there. We got it in yellow together. I will provide you all the resources you need. Starting with your brother Aaron. This is again the Reader's Digest version of Scripture. They're much more gracious with their language than I am. Sometimes when we take on the hero's heart and our knees are knocking, we have to look with different eyes at the people around us. On the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell says that the mentor will show up. That the wisdom will show up. The people you need, the tools you need, the resources you need will be there but the, here's the thing. Our human ego says, I want to see the resources first before I cut the rope. Don't you know that? Any great dream and vision were the people who felt the resources first, cut the rope, then they showed up. That's the way life works. Wayne Dyer said it beautifully when he said, we're going around this planet saying, I'll believe it when I see it. Spiritually, it's a completely opposite equation. You will see it when you believe it. You cut the rope rope. But please send somebody else. And that person, those resources are right under your nose. As close as your brother Aaron. Aaron represents the person some in this room possibly. The person in your family. The person at work. You need to see them differently. And let me tell you it is not weakness to ask for help. Heroes have to ask for help or they will fail. They will fall down the mountain. I have to listen to the voice when it says, cut the rope, and to know that un underneath me will be solid ground. There's always solid ground. And it may look like your sister, your brother, your friend, your mother. I don't know who it's going to look like, but you will know because you are open and receptive to looking with different eyes and hearing with different ears. The time has come for us to cut the rope and to look beyond our excuses 
To look beyond our limitations, they do not and will not define you. To look beyond the people tugging on the rope, wanting you to go back, telling you don't climb the mountain, the people telling you it's stupid, look beyond it. Look beyond the threshold, because on the other side of that threshold, you're going to look back and you're going to go, thank God I answered this call. Thank God I took the step, and I will never go back to being that person again. You are the Christ. You are the Buddha. You are the divine essence of life itself. I'll leave you with this final quote before we go into our meditation. It's from Lao Tzu, one of my heroes. Let's read it together. When I let go of what I am, I become what I might be. No more excuses. Let February be a month of stepping through the threshold, confronting that which needs to be confronted, letting go of that which needs to be let go of.